Welcome, everybody. Hey, everyone. We'll continue our journey in frugal science. Uh, uh, just as a tradition that we do at the start of every class, we do kind of some lighthearted uh, chit chat and getting to know each other. I'm just curious if some of you would be uh, uh, open to describing the Zoom backgrounds that you have. Some of you have virtual Zoom backgrounds. Some of you have real spaces that you are in that are very interesting. Uh, Corinne, I'm looking at you where you are sitting, Leo. I'm just curious uh, the, if anybody is willing to sort of share the backgrounds and the spaces, because of course, one thing that we will do uh, is the spaces that we create for ourselves is what drives the creativity. So I'm curious if anybody wants to take this opportunity and briefly describe your workspaces, and especially workspaces in this pandemic, where we have had to transition much of our work uh, at home rather than in our labs. Uh, so anybody who wants to take the opportunity, just raise your hand. Uh, yeah, maybe Leo, do you want to just mention where you're yeah, sitting? Yeah, and I just enabled Unmute unmuting, so you guys should all be able to talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm naturally sitting in a makerspace, which probably would be anyone's first guess for where I would be. Um, it's actually a dying makerspace right now, so I'm in the process of closing it. But fortunately, we're opening another one, so I'm just moving the equipment over to Cambridge from Boston. And yeah, what you see behind me is like a, a decal of a circuit board. I don't know what the actual circuit was, though. But it's a circuit board the size of an elephant or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What I thought would have been nice, um, but I never got around to it, was actually like wiring up a large scale version of a circuit on top of the small scale circuit. So, uh -huh. Yeah, Cor Corinne, yours is always something that catches my eye. I'm just curious, what is behind your wall? <laughs> so I'm in the garage. Um, it's my makerspace, and I teach in normal times. I teach youth here um, about biomaterial design. So what's behind me? Uh, there's some prehistoric creatures that are shadow puppets that I've used in alley workshops. Shadow puppets, a giant pencil my son made, uh, a light made of mycelium. Uh, lampshade, bone and 3D print molds. I've got a bunch of substrates for mycelium. Um, I have a 3D printer and drill presses and laser cutters. And <laughs> um, yeah, so it's uh, it's small. I mean, you're, you're seeing the depth of it really <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think on Discord, if people are willing to share pictures and uh, suggestions, just even photographs of workspaces, because it's phenomenal to learn from each other when we create certain workspaces. Uh, anybody else wants to share the space that they're sitting right now and taking this call in? Uh, I don't know, Muhammad Abbas, are you in your workspace in the uh, the science club that you created in Iraq or no, are you home? Hi, Manu. Hi, everyone. Actually, uh, no. I've totally forgot. Maybe you've never actually introduced yourself to the overall team. Can you just introduce yourself briefly too? Yeah, okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I am Mohammed. I am from Iraq. And uh, I had the chance to be the first one to start the uh, Fold Scope Club in my community. And I, had, I was the first one to bring this tool, amazing tool, to kids in my city. And uh, after some many workshops I did, uh, I was inspired to uh, do this work in more in other cities also so this thing got uh, more and more involved with other uh, maker spaces also uh, currently no I am at home and uh, we did uh, like lots of workshops in our maker space and uh, yeah uh, but because of COVID we had to stop and to uh, stop visiting schools and doing uh, workshops yeah but I will send the pictures of the makerspace later in the Discord. And the makerspace is still continuing, right? It's 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 still alive. Um, actually, uh, there's there are some challenges regarding it, mm -hmm. but I hope it will come back soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, okay, and I think before we again go into breakout rooms as last time for continuing the discussion on projects, uh, any new mentors that have joined? I don't know, Phil, if you've had the chance to introduce yourself before and you wanna briefly introduce yourself to the group. Uh, Phil Bowman. Um, yeah, well, um, I'm not a mentor or anything. I'm not sure what you're looking for here, but um, the picture behind I just, me is from I just, in yeah, go ahead. project, Engineers Without Borders, where um, another classmate, Pat Coyle, and I traveled to this little village called El Unito in Nicaragua, which is right about here someplace. This picture is taken from the top of a hill called La Pena Labrada. A great little community. They just have this hand pump well, and we're in the middle of putting in a, a full um, electric pump and storage tanks and about four kilometers of pipeline to bring clean water to this village. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just see Rico suddenly had his video on. Uh, Rico, do you wanna say a word about your workspace? Right, so, so uh, as I said the last time, uh, Manu put me on the spot, I, I am transitioning to a new phase of my life uh, as a full-time Fab Lab um, manager and owner, I guess. And, and the picture that you see as my background is the space that I'm building out uh, to, to do just that. So it, it's, I guess, uh, following on Corinne's lead, it, it's my idea of a Japanese garage, since we don't really have them here in Japan very much. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a pretty large open space where we'll, they'll be full of machines and, and whatnot. Yep. Where is the space, Rico? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's one of the, it, it's actually, uh, the, I bought the building from a, a person who lived in this building and it's one of the few steel frame buildings that was also residential. Uh, and as a foreigner in Japan, uh, it's impossible to get any kind of loan uh, except for a uh, home purchase loan. And so I, I, I sort of cheated a little bit and, um, and ended this. Anyway. I think the reason I wanted a little bit of an attention to this topic is because uh, just with the pandemic and in the future, it's obvious that we will all have workspaces at home and your space truly guides and inspires you. Uh, we don't have enough time, but if I go into my garage, I have an entire shelf of just toys that I buy and I keep, and you can see where many of the inspiration comes from. It, it's very valuable for us to invest in our workspaces and our definition of a, what a workspace is not some shiny labs. It's just what inspires you, what gets you going. And your quiet, safe space. I think I often think about that as a safe space because it's very valuable that uh, you're not being judged in your own workspace. So I think at some point of time, we'll kind of do a much more detailed session associated around how to organize your workspace, pick up cues from each other to make sure that you have the capacity, you're not just relying on, and I can already see Isaac uh, fixing his workspace in the bathroom, clearly. Uh, okay, on that note, uh, let's transition to back to designing uh, and kind of brainstorming on our projects. Uh, we had three rooms, um, health, environment, and education. And my intuition was, I know for education and health, we were not able to finish the number of teams. Emmanuel, do you know for the environment also was that the case, uh, or were you able? No, to, we no. were able to. We were able to go through all of them. I see. So one idea could be is that uh, that there could be a deeper discussion, or the other option could be is that the environmental folks could also join either the education or the health breakout rooms. Emmanuel, what do you think might be useful? Oh my, I would, I would ask them. I mean, can we poll the people who went to the environment and ask them if it's, if they feel like getting together again or would they rather go and see the other group and, and cross fertilize? Yeah, let's do a quick raise of hands. Uh, so people in environment, if you would like to go and do another uh, breakout on your own topics, uh, raise your hand. And then the alternative would be that you would, um, join the health and education ones. But for now, raise your hand if you're in an environment and would like to continue doing your own breakout. 
And I think the reason the cross fertilization is valuable is because you would see and hear the same types of advice, but being given from different people, it, it actually is quite valuable to turn things into action because you'll hear from other groups of how they are turning with the limited sets of circumstances and time, turning things into action. But we want to make sure that all teams get a chance to actually get uh, some direct feedback from other teams, which is the okay. purpose of this. Yeah. Yeah. Any? So I see no hands. Uh, let's see if, okay, now people in environment, raise your hands if you would like to go into a health or education breakout. To Is there a way for us to choose, Tyler? Why don't you just do the same situation that we did last time? Okay. I see tons of hands now. So yeah, why don't we, we'll have all three, just so you know, it sounds like lots of the environment people will be jumping to health and education breakouts. Uh, but feel free if, if environment people do want to talk to other environment people, you can also join yours. Um, so I just opened the rooms. Um, one thing, uh, if you have not yet updated your Zoom, uh, I would suggest doing that now. Uh, it'll save a lot of time because otherwise I need to go manually and pick everyone. Um, so I think it would probably be faster if you've not yet updated your Zoom and you cannot see the breakouts as an option. Um, maybe give that a shot. But otherwise, uh, I will do the same thing as I did last time. So Tyler, what you're suggesting is if some of us, which we don't see at the bottom of our screen breakout, we log out, we quickly update, and then we log in into the same link. That's correct. Yes. Okay. We will try so I that. Just, I just sent a link in the chat for how to update your Zoom. Uh, so I would take a look at that. And uh, if you currently do not see a breakouts thing next to, I think it should be next to the record button or something near the bottom. If you don't see that, uh, then probably you should update your Zoom uh, following the instructions on that link. Okay. So, Let's do that quickly and see you all in the breakout rooms. Phil, you're saying you still don't see it, huh? Right, still don't see it. Interesting. Ah. Same with me. I also recently updated and I don't okay. see them. Uh, in that case, I do not know what's going on. Um, hmm. Wow, okay, sounds like for some reason no one can still see it. That is a bummer, but that's okay. We'll just do the same thing as we did last time then. So. Um, for now, if everyone could just put down their hands so I don't accidentally confuse you with someone else. No, you it's not just the host. I know there's a decent number of people that can see it, um, but I don't know, I have not figured out yet what the difference is between the people that can and those that can't. So uh, for now, uh, why don't we do uh, those who want to join the health breakout, please raise your hands, your virtual blue hand, and I will add you to those. And then Tyler, if I can also start adding people to the rooms, I can do from the bottom, but I don't know if I have the, when I click on more, it only allows me to put people in waiting room, not in the breakout room. Huh, super weird. Um, anyway, you should just do it. Yeah, I'll just go for it. Um, and then can you move me also? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, Eves want to make a point. No. Hello, Manu. I, I can't find the little hands, but I just want to move to, to the session. Yeah, just for people who are looking for hands, the way you find hands is you go, oh, as host, maybe I can't also raise my hand. I think you have to go to um, participants and then you can... Uh, raise your hand. Uh, participant and okay, most of you have figured that part out. Uh, and we are slowly being telecommuted. Yes, sorry, it's going to take a second just because of no the, worries, no worries. The slow search problem here. <laughs> You know, it's the fact that we can all connect uh, <laughs> from faraway places is already, uh, I'm thankful for. And while we're being transported, uh, actually, maybe I'll say that in the very end, uh, we'll do the same thing around 140, we will come back and then we'll just do quick announcements. Actually, yeah. Um, 
Oh, today, maybe let's stretch it all the way to 150. And then I'll just say a very brief announcement in the end, because we don't need the 10 minutes for reconvening. So uh, whosoever is in the subgroups, please let people know that we can use the entire time. Let's go all the way till 150 in the discussions. Oh, interesting. So it looks like actually this time, uh, nobody can see the big ads to join, huh? That's weird. Yeah, and the people who are just connecting, we are transferring people to the breakout rooms. Uh, today, there are two breakout discussion rooms. One is on health, uh, and the second one is on education. Uh, the goal of the breakout rooms is brainstorming, let every team get a chance to share what their hardest challenge is, and everybody in the group is allowed to provide feedback, share ideas, uh, to make tangible concrete goals uh, by the end of a couple of weeks from now that they can prove or disprove their ideas. Yeah, so I think we only have uh, three weeks left. So it's gonna be a, a good chance to, yeah, see what, see what concrete things you can get done in those three weeks that we have. Hey Manu, maybe a short description of what you're expecting for us to have in the very last week? I will describe that. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that in the very end. So when we do reconvene at 150, I'll describe that and also the format for that. Great point, Rico. And I'm not too concerned about, you know, there's always an exponential run when you know what you should be doing. The doing part is always uh, there is a ramp up. But it's very important to be thoughtful about what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, Rico has figured out how to do this. Yeah, oh. it just suddenly appeared. It's uh, four squares at the bottom. Um, a, um, an icon that looks like a square split into four parts. Um, yeah, not for everybody. Yeah, it's so weird. Oh, no, I get it. It was because uh, Tyler assigned me to health uh, that it showed up. Oh, very mm -hmm. interesting. And Rico, when you see that, uh, do you have the option to choose which one you go into or are you forced to go into health? I'm being forced to go to health. It says, uh, yeah. Forced. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. No worries. I was just wondering if there was a little shortcut I could take, but I think, I think we're all good. Okay, so... I think everyone for health has been assigned except you, Manu. I'll send you there now. Okay. And then people, the education can be in. Oh, he's gone. Uh, Dip, I did not yet send you to health. Uh, okay, so people who would like to be sent to health, raise your hand. Your virtual blue hand. So click on participants and then raise your hand. Um, whoa, okay, we just got a whole bunch more. <laughs> Sorry, I will, I will be putting you all there. And Zoom needs to uh, improve. Yeah, I, I initially, that was the plan, um, but Zoom uh, told me that this would work uh, and clearly their platform is not yet, not yet working. So uh, this hopefully will be resolved by the next time we have to do this. Otherwise we can just do uh, two links as someone suggested. Uh, yeah, those of you uh, messaging in chat, if you just raise your hand, uh, I will get to you. I'm slowly going through this list. Sorry, I have to scroll through every time and find uh, each person because it doesn't let me search.
I, I misunderstood the instructions before that our the hand raising was just for health. So I actually wanted education. So later on. Gotcha. Yes. Yes. Hand raising is hand raising is just for health at the moment. Um, so only raise your hand if you want to be joined to the health group. And yeah, why don't we leave education in this main room so, so we don't have to waste time clicking uh, repeatedly. Yep. So as a reminder, everyone who is raising their hand uh, will be sent to health and then everyone else uh, will be staying in this uh, for the education. Ooh, we're getting close. There's like five left. <laughs> It's like a video game, Tyler. Yes, a very boring video game. Zoom needs to at least improve how fun this is when you're clicking, if not making it actually so you don't have to click so many times. <laughs> All right, we're so close, we're so close. Three more. And one more. Okay, there we go. I think everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Patrick. All right, so I think we're. I think everyone. Uh, oh, I see Nish as well. Uh, let me add you. Uh, Nish, you're raising your hand to go to health, correct? Yeah, correct. Anna. Perfect. All right, um, so everyone else who's here, uh, I think is, this is education. Um, and why don't we leave it in this in this main room, um, if people are good with that. Tyler, uh, is there already an education room that some people may have self-transferred to already? They're just sitting there waiting for the rest of us? Um, so I'm taking a look and it does not seem like anyone has joined that room. So we're gonna, um, yeah, actually no one has joined the other room. So this is everyone. All right, um, so why don't we get started? Uh, this should already be recording. So um, yeah, we can go ahead and start. I don't know where you guys left off. Fabian, do you wanna take it? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. Uh, I'm not sure how many we've got. Um, I saw Tanuj and Samir a moment ago, uh, who's in the project I'm mentoring. Uh, I don't know what other projects there might be in education. So maybe if you uh, haven't, I gave a description of the uh, Frugal SEM project last time. Uh, I don't know if Samir, who has already got some spectacular demonstrations, uh, uh, wants to say something. Yes, there's Tanuj waving his hand. He has to unmute himself. Hey there. there he goes. Go ahead, Tanu. Tell us all about the electron detector. Um, well, I'm still researching it, but the basic idea is that, uh, well, when electrons get backscattered off of a uh, sample, which we want to image, we just want to read that using uh, an electron detector. And that's basically going to be, as far as I understand it, it's just going to be a semiconductor that uh, gives off a signal when an electron, um, like when it encounters an electron. So I do know there's a lot of architectures that exist for that, but I'm yet to figure out which one would be the most, the best for a frugal application and also the, the easiest one to make because you don't want to go into some like 
really obscure uh, architectures and uh, elements to use for that. So that's basically where I am right now with the, uh, the, the, uh, the detector. And that's what the idea behind it is. So the whole range of photo detectors and solar cells, and you're going to pick uh, one that looks the most frugal and uh, without losing effectiveness. Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds right. OK, good. Now, Samir has all kinds of stuff. And the last question he was, he's trying to do the stable high voltage set. And he has an old color TV uh, which can generate 25 kilovolts, which makes me a bit nervous because uh, I think the color TV supplies were lethal. Um, but he's asking if you can use the flyback transformer as a high voltage generator, which is, I believe, what they used to, or what they did uh, in those days. And I think the answer is yes, but uh, don't do it before you've talked to me about the safety issue. Do you want to add anything, Samir? He also has made a vacuum pump. Uh, so, uh, but he yeah, seems. Yeah, I have uh, uh, made some uh, progress on the vacuum pump and the high voltage. But um, I saw a YouTube channel um, and um, he also made a DIY uh, SCM. So he was uh, talking about uh, uh, we have to have uh, only regulated high voltage. We cannot use a flyback transformer. So, so I was wondering if you can uh, help me on the voltage part of this project. Okay, I think that's you and I will take that offline now, Shai, because that's all right. Now, sure, were there sure. any other, anyone else wants to contribute to the Fugal Sem? Uh, sounds like a some kind of wind instrument, doesn't it? Flugelhorn, yeah. Um, okay, what other projects were there in education? Raise your blue hand. I don't see anyone. Tyler, do you see anyone? Uh, I see Liz. Uh, Liz, if you want to go for it. I know that, yeah, I know that there are quite a few projects here. So um, I think this is, yeah, this is a great chance yeah, just to, to share progress and challenges and, and anything that uh, I know, I know lots of these teams do have questions and things like that. And this is a place where, um, yeah, I think lots of, if you have a question, probably lots of other teams have similar questions or, or can learn from, from that experience. So here's a good place to just share out and, and uh, yeah, say whatever, whatever questions you, you might want answered. So um, Liz, why don't you go for yes. It? Hi. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I represent a team uh, that is working on the topic. Uh, we call ourselves the uh, Plant Antimicrobial um, Discovery Kit. So our purpose um, is to identify plants anywhere in the world that can have some antimicrobial resistance. And we are doing it in the context of educating people of the topic of antimicrobial resistance. Um, we have met a couple times already, and I think we have a really good plan. Many of you may have seen our notebook because Tyler put it on the announcements as an example of what you could do as a uh, notebook uh, in, on Notion. So um, it's about five or six of us, and we have assigned each other um, areas, what we think uh, for the project. Some of it is the actual kit to test plants. Um, the other part of it, major part of it, is the educational component. So how can we use this to kit not only to gather information, so the name and the type of plants that have microbial, antimicrobial activity, but also use it as a way to teach the concept of antimicrobial uh, resistance. And um, we also have a small part where we have two uh, members, which are Harry and Atlas, who are also uh, providing some, some of their expertise in other meetings, in, so, sorry, in other groups. And what they're doing, they're actually creating this very interesting compact incubator um, for uh, plates that, to, that we use like agar plates. Um, so we, our challenge is it's because it's such a broad, I, ha, I guess it has different areas. Um, it requires a lot of moving pieces. So we have already an idea for a, a DIY frugal 
way of growing bacteria at home and test plants for uh, the ability to not let bacteria grow. Um, but I guess we still need ideas that may frugalize it um, more. Um, I know that some of my uh, peers in the team were already in discussion with some people in here. I was not able to attend, so I don't know if they had some feedback, um, but we we probably need ideas about um, the source of bacteria and how to grow bacteria that doesn't require petri dishes um, or even the growing medium. We have heard um, uh, some ideas of using um, bottle caps, um, but that that brings other ideas. So this is the team. I think some of us are in here, um, and that is. Our project and it has a lot of moving pieces but the notion our notion notebook is open to anybody and it's on the announcement that tyler put on okay anyone else so wants to say something on the education front yes subir uh, hi, I, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, frugal tools for visually impaired people uh, that we are interested. That's the team. And uh, currently what we are looking at is uh, how to represent 2D images, how to transform 2D images in the form of uh, something that is embossed on a piece of paper so that we could um, communicate images or diagrams with uh, people who are visually impaired. So we have a lot of ideas, but all of these seem very complicated to implement in the given two, three weeks, but that's the general uh, direction. And uh, currently it's all, we are, we are very much confused as to which way should we go ahead and what is the frugal, what is the frugal tool we could make? Tyler? Yeah, no, super interesting, Subir. Why don't, do you, do you think it would be valuable? I think it might be valuable for the group just to, for everyone to hear sort of what's your thought process behind these like um specifically like uh which which problems do you think you're hoping to solve f with yeah. this and from there like what uh what's your thought process at least so far going into the design um because i think people once they hear your thought process i think that's a great sure. way to, to help others to sort of start contributing ideas to it. okay uh so the thought process is that we need we we understand that a lot of science and mathematics is a 2D representation, uh, the way we learn it in schools uh, or in colleges. And that, because it's a very visually intensive uh, medium, uh, that is completely blocked to people who cannot see. And so what we want to do is to find a way to convert anything that is 2D, like any representation in paper into something that is embossed. And we would eventually want, I mean, the ideal thing would be to connect it to a digital medium like at the internet, but that's that's a later stage. What we currently want is suppose we have an image, how do we convert it into something that is uh, felt by fingers? How, if we slide over the image, we should be able to feel. Um, yeah, instead of seeing it, we should like if it's a ant, uh, it's a diagram of an ant, or if it's a diagram of some insect. Uh, can we feel it by hand? So one of the ideas, what, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a very broad topic. Uh, we, are, we are very much confused as to what is the easier way of doing this. There are what the, uh, yeah. What is the density of nerve endings of, of fingertips? Because that seemed to me would be a, a rather crucial uh, parameter to nail down. I mentioned mm -hmm. last time the Opticon, you, yeah, I don't know if anyone looked up the Opticon and saw where it went. Um, yeah, yeah. But someone told me that fingertips and the tongue are the two parts of our anatomy that have the highest density of nerve endings. But yeah. I don't know how high. Yes, yeah. Harshit. Harshit. Yeah, Subir, when you said about feeling the object, feeling the whatever tool, you, whatever, say, hand that you want to convey to the people who can't see, can 3D printing be of any use? Because I've seen some people having 3D printers. So in the short term, can you do something with 3D printing? Just an idea I'm shooting. Sure, sure. So we thought about 3D printing, but 3D printing is very slow. Uh, the One of the major problems is uh, visually impaired people would like to have the same uh, uh, speed in which they can access information. So 3D printing would be very slow and a costly process. What uh, could be, you know, instead of 
uh, in, in, instead of uh, say plastic, would we have any other material that we can use to, you know, have a fast three D printing process? And then the whole cost of it is also very important. So, like we would like to create, uh, just as a printer, can we ma match the speed of a like a laser printer or something for uh, embossed images? If I may jump in, what what is the um the the application that you're really thinking? Are you thinking of like textbooks being like people being able to feel those? Because I just I find it hard to see like what what is the your target audience in terms of is it students learning in classes? So you want them to be able to feel it on their books, or do you want these like um, models that they can feel? Because those kinds of things um, exist to a degree already, right? Like uh, um, 3D models of the eyes, whether they've been, you know, yeah. produced in an industrial setting or just 3D printed on the side. So, I guess w where are you guys looking to add value on that chain? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So the problem with models is that uh, there are many concepts, and so a person who has to learn these things has to carry, or the school has to carry a lot of models, mm -hmm. uh, and then that will scale up. Uh, so a library of models would be a huge library. Uh, so what we want is to just focus on a medium that could be uh, content agnostic. I mean, it could be any content which uh, there's any any uh, tool that could transform any image into say 3D embossed uh, paper. So we are targeting at school and uh, education. Uh, uh, we are targeting at uh, education um, students, students who are right. doing uh, education. Yeah, and and and, and I'm I'm no expert, but just thinking about that kind of thing you were saying like even even making it available on the internet so like what what would that look like because like i i touch my screen and there's no there's no difference right so yeah. are, are you visualizing like a future innovation by someone else that's going to enable screens that can feel things or that or would what? be the yeah that would be the ultimate device right but but it doesn't exist yet uh, these exist. There are some university level research projects, but then we don't know the cost because one of the major problems is uh, the anything, even a normal a refreshable Braille keyboard costs around $2,000. So it's not really accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So the, only, yeah. The, the only other thing that I would say, and, and then I'll, uh, I'll mute myself again, is just the um, like, I, I find it curious why you decided to go with tactile as opposed to converting um, these models into like an audio form in terms of like trying to take the, the colors and, and things like that and um, like almost using metadata so that they can, they can read this, these models and understand them that way as opposed to tactile because that, that is easier access and sure. the technology is already there as far as the internet goes. Like you could create an app that you, you're mm -hmm. on a model and it you know reads to you kind of what the model is. So did, did you guys consider that? Or is that something that you're, yeah. you're looking to or, or is it still, you wanna stick with like the tactile specifically? And like, what would be the reason for that? Sure, uh, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. Uh, we haven't thought so much as to how even images or you know, uh, representations could be converted into audio through say frequency mapping or something like that. Uh, but that's, that's certainly a very interesting way. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, if it's audio, it could be easily connected to uh, digital uh, electronic media. So that would be a nice thing. But yeah, we need, if, if, if there's an, a good idea for that, why not? Uh, Subir, if you want, I can jump in sure. very quick also. Yes, then. Um, I think part of the, the reason that we were leaning more towards tactile things was because like, a lot of things, yeah, you can explain them audibly, but um, I personally like have a hard time understanding, for example, like abstract mathematical concepts um, that could be explained like visually or like with the model, for example, like a saddle point. Um, like it's a little bit harder to explain like audibly. Um, and so that was kind of the general idea. And I think that maybe an in-between, like before getting to like some digital device that creates like a, a you know, like a tactile, thing is to have like for example in textbooks currently like sometimes you'll see like links to websites that have videos so another idea would be to have like a link to like some set of instructions for building your own model um, out of like some 
you know, some tool that can like change shape easily. Um, so I think that would be maybe like a more frugal and more realistic option, right? Like if you press a link and all of a sudden they're like, it's like a, the equivalent of like a G code, right? Like coordinates for like, if you have this three dimensional graph, like exactly how to build it on your own. Um, so yeah, th those were some of the other ideas that we had. Yeah, my, my only concern is how does a person who's visually impaired click on the link and then after clicking on the link, read the instructions on how to build it. Um, and, and that's maybe an area where, um, you know, vi uh, audio, audio instructions would be like really helpful. But now that you're saying it that way, it almost seems like one thing you could do and, you know, just staging the project at different steps, obviously like DIY instructions would be nice. And even though 3D printing is not super accessible, even just like links, but links to like a CAD file that you don't have to design it yourself. It's just, if you have access to a 3D printer. So now here is this whole database of models you can look at and print them so that um, as long as you have access, and again, you know, an accessibility issue is inevitable when it comes to 3D printing. Um, now you can easily print it and then feel it. So that would, that, that, those are, you know, that, that's my more than two cents. So I, I, I hope that kind of helps you guys because I, I definitely can simplify, sympathize with like at present being a little lost on, on the project and I'll probably jump in later to talk about mine. So I hope I could help a little bit, at least ideate. Well, thanks yeah. Jacob. Sure. I'd like to sort of make a mention of the same pitch as I did last time that uh, is we only have, I heard three weeks to go, uh, we really have to start concentrating on one or two aspects of these projects. Uh, the SEM project, the uh, tactile imaging pro project, uh, uh, and the others. Um, I, I've seen a lot of very broad descriptions of uh, strategy, or rather the overall picture of where we want to go. Now we've got to really nail down one or two aspects to show that we can make some concrete uh, um, progress and uh, I wouldn't pick too ambitious a one at this point because uh, Murphy will strike again if uh, you know what I mean. Uh, so Tyler uh, is you still around? Yes I am so yeah I, I would I would completely agree with you and I think um, some yeah as I'm listening to this I think there yeah fantastic ideas all around both you know from the team and Jacob thanks and that was yeah I think a really great way I think I, I love seeing the different perspectives coming in and looking at these I think, um, yeah, I would I would definitely agree in terms of narrowing that problem down. Because um, I think, you know, like, if you think about something where, you know, if you could solve this, right, like, it would change, you know, billions of people's lives around the world. And that means that that probably is something that um, you can't do immediately in, in three weeks, right? Like, you can't, like, fix the problem of, like, having visually impaired people be able to, you know, effectively see all of their textbooks in three weeks. Um, but what you can do is, I think, specify down. So I've heard some discussions of, you know, maybe it sounds like you guys are interested in doing things that are like related to like math concepts. Like maybe that's an area where you can specify and say, all I want is I want to be able to represent a graph very clearly in 3D with, you know, a cost under $1, uh, like, a, like a pencil that I can use to represent a graph to anyone who's visually impaired. Like that's a, that's a tractable problem and it's something that I think you can prototype for sure. Um, Obviously, that doesn't have to be your problem, but whatever it is that I think if you guys can come together and say, like, here's a very specific problem. There's, um, you know, currently there are people who can't see and they're missing all of this information. And here's this very crucial piece of information that we're going to enable with a very frugal project. So whether that's a graph or whether that's an equation or, or, or a certain, certain structure, um, I think specifying in that will help you very narrowly say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then take those steps forward in the next three weeks so that you can have something uh, like a prototype or something, something simple to show and say, "Hey, look, this is why this might work." Yeah, totally following up yeah. on Tyler's uh, comment, I I, compl I was thinking math as well. When you mentioned math, uh, immediately I thought that of of something that you could do. So I thought of the torus. Uh, people take paper strips and twist it, put it together, and they immediately have a shape, right? So. Uh, kirigami or origami along those lines would be a great solution. So perhaps find, as, as Tyler was suggesting, start to, instead of doing every equation or every graph, pick a few that could be represented by paper. You wanted something fast. Paper is by far the fastest way to represent anything. So start with the torus and then go with another mathematical shape and try to figure out a way to do that out of paper and then to start building a, a, uh, 
a what a library of of kirigami shapes or and i'm sure they probably exist already there are people who probably have cut these things out of paper before so maybe you start there start with math start with uh, equations and then um as as you get expertise you can expand to other fields and then uh, you mentioned that 3D printing is slow. That is absolutely true. But once you print it, you can mold and cast the uh, 3D print object and you can make thousands of these things. Uh, and the material that you can't, well, unfortunately, the material you cast with these days, well, you could do it out of plaster, I guess. that That's less destructive than plastic. Uh, so for the first one will be hard and will take a long time. But the second, third, and hundredth object will, can be molded and casted. Yeah, that, I just want to nice share idea. one uh, project that not my idea, but a seventh grader who created this paper embossing tool using stepper motors and Arduino and just using a ballpoint pen with the G code data, the sample image. The whole idea was um, anybody can just put the image and that comes and it was pretty fast. Um, uh, and it's similar principle that you have in any basic paper cutter, which are like less than hundred dollars, but he made it. Um, and the other attribute that I liked about it, as the machine was working, it was creating some kind of sound. So you can also like hear when it's in action and when it stops. Um, so I saw it as a science fair. Um, thought I would just share that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Pesha. Could you do you have a link to share? Or? Um, I will share you the device that he used to build that, but uh, maybe okay. that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so yeah. I had a I question for you. So Subir, I had a question for you. This is Rishi. Um, I'm just curious. I'm, um, when it comes to, uh, say, visually challenged, um, if uh, talking to them, like some objects that they have interacted, kind of talking to them and ask them to describe um, the sensory parts and what they are seeing and thinking and how their brain is. And so that would give you like, a positive control, like, okay, um, this person, this condition can see this particular shape or whatever, it could be Taurus or whatever, and then kind of, they'll give you a positive control and kind of start to build on that. So you'd kind of keep the need in mind and, and then kind of work backwards rather than take an idea and kind of, that's one way to do it. The other way is you could start from either of the ends and say, okay, I know this is the end goal, this is my starting point. Then you can do kind of build on, uh, you know, flip flops of thought process and actions to kind of join the two ends in a zigzag curve. So that would, yeah. I think that would give you a positive control and uh, maybe a starting point to build on. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure Definitely. of our time. Are there any other projects besides the tactile imaging uh, uh, in the education breakout room who'd like to? comment on the projects. So I don't want to cut anyone out who's got something to contribute here. Uh, and again, if Tyler's around, uh, I, I had trouble logging in at the beginning, so I'm not sure what's supposed to happen this afternoon. Are we supposed to stop at some point or what? At least at some point we obviously do, but at what point? I think we should continue going forever. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, we're, we're going to be stopping at 1.50 today. So we have around 30 minutes. So we keep this discussion going if there's enough to be said until 150. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, um, thanks. I think given what we've gotten so far, I think really, yeah, this is this is perfect. Like getting getting a deep dive in like where are you guys feeling stuck? Um, because I think every yeah, like people are gonna have problems in similar areas, whether that's like the scale is too big, too small, um, missing mentors and certain things. I, I think that's gonna be very, very useful too. So yeah, any anyone whose project is has anything like that will be super useful just to chat about. Now, wasn't the frugal backpack part of this uh, uh, education plan? Does anyone here want to say anything about the frugal backpack, as I recall last time? Yeah, we weren't sure. We already presented, and there hasn't been like much progress since Tuesday. So, what a full two again, days or I don't, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. I just didn't because I don't want to cut anyone off. Uh, uh, no, I think the tactile imaging uh, has all kinds of opportunities, and uh, we've heard a lot of good ideas. So uh, uh, keep thinking and uh, start uh, concentrating, I think. 
I felt that suggestion of uh, uh, picking a, a few paper models to uh, illustrate. Uh, I'd like to see you do a saddle point in paper. That would be a, a, a nice one that uh, you could think about. Shaikh, at one point you had your hand up, but I didn't hear you say anything. Yeah, so um, I also made that um, CNC plotter, um, which can um, help uh, the visually impaired people to um, kind of get an idea of the model. So if uh, if the team wants some help, I can help them. Shaikh, you told me you're a high school student. You seem to have an extraordinary range of skills and background. Did I hear you correctly that you're still a high school student? Yeah, yeah, I am still a high school student. Wow. Uh, well, I hope you get your uh, application in for Stanford. Uh, uh, I'm not on the admissions committee, so I can't help. I, all I can do is encourage you and all of you to apply. Um, Berkeley, Berkeley. Yeah, well, I go left bears. Berkeley. Uh, I went to Berkeley when the free speech movement broke out and uh, uh, was there for three years and then went to Bell Labs. But Berkeley's not a bad school, I've got to say. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Could, could, could I talk? I, I know that uh, Team Operation Moonwatch Frugal Telescope uh, spoke. Oh, about. yes, the Frugal Telescope. But uh, I think there's a lot to be uh, talked about yeah. there. So, uh, I raised um, the issue of um, uh, tolerances, and I wondered if uh, in the full two days since then you've made a lot of progress on that. Um, no, I, I think I think we have a baseline. <laughs> it, it, it's been so so probably the biggest uh, uh, difficulty for us uh, is is one we're coming to terms with the fact that we have only three weeks to go. The second mm -hmm. is uh, not really having a clear idea of what the end point for for this course will be for us. What is our final project presentation and what's expected? So, our ambitions are, are massive. Uh, I mean, all, all of us on the team want to have a working telescope in three weeks, uh, but um, I, I have a $160 telescope that has very similar uh, specifications to what we're trying to do right now. So we're basically trying to take this equipment and reduce it the cost by 16 times. So as far as we're concerned, our challenge is not to reinvent the telescope, but to figure out a way to make it ten dollars to to cost reduce this thing, so what can we, how can we reduce costs is, is really the challenge, uh, and and obviously optics without good optics you you know when you look into a cheap there's nothing worse than looking into a, a cheap telescope because you get a view that is disappointing and and it, I think it might actually turn you off from astronomy, so uh, right now our our goal is to try to spend. $99 of our $10 on optics and only $1 on, on structure. And uh, it, it might've been described in our last meeting that, that uh, one of the directions is to create the structure out of bamboo, uh, that because it, it's pretty much widely available in most parts of the world uh, and it it's grows like weeds. So if you can figure out a way to get yourself some bamboo, you could build a structure out of that. And the, the concept, uh, the, the structural concept we're working with, that I, I'm super excited about is basically like a basket, create a ball out of bamboo with an aperture at the top and the mirror could be at the bottom. So instead of it, the structure is both a telescope structure and a mount because you can roll the ball to move it and, and an all azimuth um, uh, movement without an additional mount underneath the telescope since we're thinking about this being more of a tabletop uh, individual use kind of thing. So I'm going all over the place, but biggest difficulty is figuring out when to stop and what to stop on uh, and figuring out a way to spend only $9 on optics. You mentioned a vanity mirror last time. Uh, it might be worthwhile sort of seeing how good a vanity mirror could be. Yes, yes, the, the one and of you our. You don't necessarily have to make a telescope. You could do it with some kind of a laser beam and uh, uh, and check uh, its aberrations. 
That's that's a great idea. Actually, yeah, our, our one of our assignments was for each of us to go out and get a uh, vanity mirror uh, of different uh, magnifications and just start testing it. Yeah. I'm not sure where we are on that. I, I, you know what? In Japan, it's I'm actually having a hard time finding it in a regular store. Uh, I'm having to go on Amazon to to get vanity mirrors for whatever reason. Shaving mirrors are not a big deal here in Japan. Maybe oh. because I can't like I can't grow a beard. Maybe no one shaves in Japan. I don't know. So. Yeah. Um, and then there was frugal optics in general. Now I was a little concerned that I didn't hear, I heard a lot of again generalities, I didn't hear a specific project, but I'm, my attention span is limited now. Uh, uh, would the frugal optics people like to say something? Are there any here? Any frugal opticians? And I think, I don't know, um, Evelyn, I think I saw you unmuted yourself earlier. Did you have something? Yeah. Um, I I would like to talk about my project, but it doesn't fall into the optics uh, realm. I think that's okay. Why don't Why don't we just go for it? whoever is on and uh, wants to talk about their project can go for it. So Evelyn, why don't you take the floor? Sure. So our project is about negotiation training. Uh, currently, negotiation coaches cost like more than a hundred dollar per uh, per hour. Um, but many people, especially young professionals or lower income people, we don't know how to negotiate our salary and how to talk to our boss for like uh, for a promotion or even for smaller things like buying our first house. How do we negotiate the offer? Um, so I'm so we are we are thinking of creating like a chatbot based virtual negotiation opponent. So for the chatbot, uh, we will give it a prompt uh, saying like the chatbot is a friendly boss who is willing to give a raise, but just needs a good reason. And then um, it is using uh, OpenAI's uh, latest natural language processing uh, engine, which is called GPT-3. And we have built a prototype uh, using that and uh, hooked up that with Google's Dialogflow uh, as the um, as the wrapper and platform. So we have a sort of working bot already that can listen to the user and respond and act as her boss, uh, sort of. Um, then my general question is how useful that is. Let's say I am a human and I know I am going going to uh, negotiate my salary with my boss tomorrow. What I use the bot to, <laughs> to chat, and, and and also how would the bot guide um, the user? Because sometimes the bot will throw out like pretty um, sophisticated questions, like like okay, yeah, I can give you a raise, but give me a good reason, that kind of thing. But sometimes we don't have a good control of of what the bot says, and because it it, it, it can get creative. And uh, uh, it's not necessarily being a good coach to the user. So I'm just like a good, so just want to get some uh, uh, input about how we should handle negotiation coaching. Um, I think it's a great project, by the way. I, it has a measure of originality that uh, I think is unsurpassed here. Um, who is on your team? I forget. Oh, uh, they are all in India, so I don't think it's, uh, uh, they, they usually do not attend the class uh, uh, during the- You're season. not in India though. Uh, Where no, are you? I'm in the Bay Area. Oh, you're Bay Area, okay. Harshit, you had a question? Oh, okay. Uh, no, I think being able to uh, get some pointers on how to be a successful negotiator is a skill that uh, I certainly could have done with on many occasions, and I think that's true of all of us. So, uh, um, so what is your? You mentioned I think something like a was it a template or something a, uh, a step by step uh, guide on uh, what to say and what not to say and how to approach it. Yeah, so there are two kind, two two schools of thoughts here. One is template based, so uh, let the bot have sort of a a list of questions they will need to check off, like uh, why do you need a raise? What's in it for me? And do you have any other um, uh, 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 proposals? 
and that kind of uh, template based uh, questions that the bot can throw uh, to to the user. And and the other approach is to just let the bot be creative <laughs> and uh, uh, throw out any and and just use uh, the um, the open AI's capability uh, to uh, to uh, to have a free form conversation uh, with the user. And um, well, how about also a guidebook for the boss? Guidebook for the boss. Oh. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, great project. So there's what, five, five of you involved in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, roughly five. Four, good, five. good. So who else wants to say something? We've got uh, 20 minutes or a bit less now or left. Uh, yeah, I could jump in real quick just on Evelyn's. Um, yeah, it's super, super interesting. I think uh, you, yeah, you come up against a, sounds like it's the, the big question of uh, all AI, you know, these days is how much do you template versus how much do you let the AI be creative? Exactly. And I know uh, Tesla and, and Google are fighting over that right now and we'll see, we'll see who wins. Um, but yeah, big, big, big question for sure. Um, yeah, when I think about it, I mean, I, I think one thing that might be interesting um, for you guys, maybe sort of specifying down into the negotiation problem, like, um, what are the main barriers to someone being good at negotiating? Like, is it is it that people feel too self-conscious to actually um, initiate that conversation and speak up? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it that they don't know what they would say in that time? Um, or, or is it that maybe what they would say is not actually the right thing to say? So I think there are different levels. Um, and one thing that just struck me is that uh, whether it's templated or not, I think one thing that's helpful is getting getting a like someone to actually speak up and i think getting the, the discussion of someone yeah someone who can you know just basically just practicing talking out loud uh in itself is very very useful i think regardless of whether it's templated or or, or being creative against you as you know you're talking to someone and they're talking back at you um i think that that in itself does have some value so it might be might be worth specifying and thinking like which, which of these aspects do we want to tackle? Maybe it's to give you some coaching on, on up, up front and also you can practice the speech part of it. Um, I, I definitely don't have any answers for you because that's such a big question and is, is one that's definitely going to require lots of playing around and tuning. But maybe something that will help is just out loud, just practicing with, with the thing and saying, what, what of this do I find useful and what of this do I not find useful? Um, and also, you know, if you have friends or someone who's actually going to be interviewing for a job or, or in a negotiation situation, have them practice with it and see what they find useful versus not um, that might help inform your design yeah yeah you you actually touched uh, touched upon a very important question um according to some of the uh research i've done one major reason why people don't negotiate is that they don't want to lose the job and they don't feel they have the bargaining power uh, that is one thing and second they don't know the uh, the market rate so they, they don't have enough information to back up their uh, their, their their claim. Um, so there are these two uh, things that we can do. One is to how to like make them more confident, and 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 the other one is how to supply them with the useful in information and what is the um, reasonable salary um, for them. Maybe almost, um, if I may, really quick, just giving it uh, the ability to to ask a question or even like almost like a, a, pre a preparation stage before you go into the negotiation, like being able to ask the bot, what are some common reasons that people can get a raise, you know, so that they start to get these ideas and before they go into it, that way they're not like swimming in the dark and mm -hmm. they kind of know, all right, so common ways that people get a raise are they describe the market rate, they do these things. And then that way, you know, because like you said, if you're working with a bot that's creative and the person is trying to be creative, then you're ending up with two people like going in a direction that's not necessarily negotiation. So if you help them to know like what they, they, the ways that they should be justifying themselves, at least to give them examples to start with, I think that would be a valuable parameter. Because like you said, they don't know on what grounds they're allowed to negotiate, you know, mm. and uh, just giving them some, some example ones would be good. And I don't know if, if you want to almost make it like further gamify it and further make it something that is 
easy to understand in the sense that, you know, you are X person as opposed to being yourself and almost like playing the game that way. And that's another thing to consider because that also might make it more structured because you can't go through and say, oh, this is the market rate for everything. But if you are a, a restaurant manager in, you know, um, the Bay Area, what is your market rate? What are the reasons someone might give you things? And like that way you can create a profile that they start with. They get to learn about their profile and then they go into the negotiation. Oh, so these are just ideas that I have. Negotiation is something that I really like um, and I've done on the side and just getting better at it and looking at it. I, I, I remember, I, I, I know we, we spoke a little bit offline too, just about not making it negotiation villain because mm -hmm. one of the, like the key facets of negotiation I learned is just like, there's a pie, we're gonna split it one way. And really the goal is to make the pie bigger, not to take a bigger slice. So just this idea of they want you to work harder and feel valued. So there, there is benefit to both people. And it's not that your boss is fighting with you to like keep your salary low. But those are, those are just some of my thoughts. So. Thanks, Mike, just just yeah. for a quick, Patrick. if I could just step in for a quick moment, that it occurs to me that one other way to think about this is not just in the kind of negotiation with a boss or a power structure, mm -hmm. but just to think about it in the kind of collaboration we're trying to do. How do you negotiate to closure on a set of teams and team members that you want to work with mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of how, how you're going to share, share responsibilities, how you're going to work together and so forth? Because right. Um, these days I'm retired, so I'm not trying to negotiate for a raise, but I am trying to recruit for good projects and good volunteer engagements. And so that's just another wrinkle on this that it might be worth thinking about. And any, and those of you who are younger and have to make a living, so much of it is now freelance or gig, or it's not the conventional kind of thing. Back in the day when Roger and I began working, you could envision at Bell Labs or at Lawrence Livermore, you know, a decades long career. I don't know how many of you young people think of dec decades long careers with a single employer. So I think that there, there's another aspect of this space that's worth considering. I, I did also want to back up just for a moment. And, and I know we, we talk about problems rather than solutions, but I suspect most of us know about res Raspberry Pis. I'm thinking about a solution platform that might be handy for some of these things. Um, and I see one instance of it in, a, in an item called Rachel, which is an educational server that's being deployed uh, to bring educational content to places uh, where you don't have internet connectivity, but you can bundle up, you know, uh, uh, they, they now build their, their educational servers as the, the, Ra uh, the, the Raspberry Pi based versions as almost a demo version, but they're still sturdy enough to serve a small classroom or a small community of people, you know, and you can configure and get this image from them for free comes loaded with big chunk of the Khan Academy, big chunk of Wikipedia, big chunk of open science kind of stuff. And oh, by the way, you can load it up with whatever else kind of stuff that you want to serve. And it presents as a web page when you, you point to it to its Wi Fi hotspot. So I don't mean to get too carried away about that. But I would just point out that that's another thing that might have value for some of the folks who are looking for inexpensive platforms to serve some of these solutions. Thanks, Patrick. Any more comments? We've all had to, I think Patrick raises a good point. Uh, as you said, I'm in the same situation. I'm trying to get people to volunteer to do various things around here. And uh, I wish I had better negotiating skills. So I'm going to follow this project for, with a lot of interest. <laughs> Thanks, Evelyn. That, that was very Thank good. You. Thanks, everyone. Okay, who else would like to say something? Uh, we haven't actually heard from the... Ah, oh, Harshit? You have to... Yeah. Oh, good. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is idea from the ecology room, but this is also in a way in education, I guess. So the idea is basically this that we're working on and, the, and it's the ant family, our team is called. So we are trying to build an app to identify ants because ants in the long term, if you monitor them, you can potentially use them as bioindicators of environment. So it's basically uh, making an app which can identify ants and also people can take photos and upload them with geodata. Uh, and uh, we can crowdsource this data in long term, uh, understand how the ants, where we are finding how 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 much of how much of diversity of ants. And uh, another part of this problem is, uh, with respect to taking photos, is that ants are very small, so you cannot get clear photos with say this mobile of very small ants. 
So that's another uh, limitation that we have or a problem that we're trying to tackle. And the third is uh, how well can we classify or identify ants using a fold scope? So ants have these very uh, specific um, uh, features on say antenna, which are used for identification. So we are exploring that. Uh, so what I wanted to put forward is uh, with respect to app making, Emmanuel sir suggested that uh, uh, we have many people here with their experience in AI. Uh, and we have been appointed with Lucas Venezuela as our guide. So if anyone can suggest on how to go about the app making, because I've seen some people with computer science background, uh, that would be very helpful. And also I've been thinking about 3D printing, but we didn't propose this, but how well can we print ant models uh, for education and, you know, and making people understand basic differentiation between ants. Yeah. Any okay. advice will be very useful. This is Liz. Um, I have a question for Harshit. So a uh, question. So um, maybe it's not within the three things that you said, but um, I think being on the education room, one of the things that I keep thinking on the back of the head is that um, who would be your audience for this app? It will be anyone. So the reason why we took ants is that uh, anyone can say a difference between an ant and a non-insect for non-ant insect. For example, and you have ants everywhere. So we only expect people to uh, take photos of ants and uh, give the geodata and the date of the uh, date of the photo taken. That's it. The identification will be under peer review. But we would also like people to understand what the different kinds of ants. So that is the education part. So citizen science, we want to make it interactive. So that is there. So anyone basically, you know, who can take photos of ants. So. I, and, and, and I think that's great because um, it reminds me, maybe not sure of you, but many someone in here might know about this app called iNaturalist yeah. and they pretty much crowdsource. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess the question I'm trying to get at that I probably is removed from the actual app. Um, so I, I think you say anyone can do this. I think my, my question for even for my own project is how am I going to recruit people? And I think Manu touched on this. I think it's very important to see people not as a way to gather just data, but actually involving them in the process. So it's not to just tell them, hey, take a picture and that's it, right? So that requires a lot of building community. So I think in any education related project, there's got to be a an important point to look and think of community building because an app on its own will not solve anything. Um, so for example, in my project where we're trying to crowdsource plans, we are embedding the project in schools as a way to start. And the reason is that's a way to build community. I naturalist, I think has the success that it has because it has been used in science museums and natural museums, mm -hmm. right? So I think that if anything, at least in my project, and I use it as a way to project it to yours, is that if anything comes from this frugal science is to think about of this as a community. I think Manu touched on this, like yeah, all of yeah. them are possible because of this. So I think that in any of the projects in here, even if it's a frugal backpack, you got to think about of the community that you want to serve, right? Um, and it oftentimes starts small and you build up from that, right? And one of the things in my project that we're doing with plants, one of the things that we make people is that we make them part of the discovery. And that means if someone sends us information about this plant, and this is something that my PI and I were talking about, the investigator, somebody finds a plan with activity, antimicrobial activity, they should be in the paper and they should be part of anything that comes with that discovery because we make them part of it. So we just don't use them as a, all right, come in, take a picture and have fun. Um, so I, I keep hearing and I've heard it in other teams and I, don't, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but I am a teacher and I've taught in schools, I've taught in science museums and I've seen all these amazing ideas, but they don't build community. And I think that community should be part of any education, even if it's just your 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 city or if it's your school or your university. So I wanted to say that because I think all of these, and even in the previous one where you were talking about uh, the team, uh, we're talking about the 3D modeling, you need to 
you need to be in contact with disability communities and you have to have people that are experts in accessibility because if you do not have a disability you cannot speak for those that say okay well what visually people need is a way of touching something so that they can understand something there's so many layers to it okay and i don't yeah. think it can be achieved in this frugal science i don't i don't think but it is amazing yeah, have honest, so yeah. many people so i wanted to say that because it is something that we have talked in our team. And I think that for me, the most important part is building that community. So it is not part of what he, the th three things he said, and some sure maybe does AI, I don't, but I wanted to put that because when you say anyone is gonna come and do this, but who is it? How are you gonna connect them? How are you gonna target them? That's that's something that you need to keep in mind. Yeah. Liz, so that's great. I uh, see Tyler, everyone is giving you a thumbs up. Uh, so yeah. congratulations. I'm, I'm, uh, Tyler, is this recorded, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Liz, great. just an uh, answer to your info. awesome suggestions. Uh, as far as we didn't discover, we didn't discuss the geographical range where we want this app to work. But since all of us are based in India, so we would like to get it in India. Uh, with respect to community building, we already have, uh, as a possible collaborator, we are thinking, uh, at least I think there is this uh, uh, homegrown platform called Biodiversity Atlas India. You can check it out. Uh, so it has many websites like Butterflies of India, Moths of India, Cicadas of India, Mammals of India, and so on. So there is no Ants of India. So I don't know. I mean, we, have, we haven't gone to conclusions, but citizen science in India is pretty established. But yes, we have to look at the specifics of who we, we are going to contact. And also in education, when it comes, how do we engage people? That is very important. And yeah, we will surely think about that. And but thank you for that awesome speech. No, that's that's fine. And and look for your champions. Like the same way yeah. Manu was talking about his champions that he had to fold scope become something. You need yeah. to find your champion. And I think it starts as simple as going to your neighboring community. So mm -hmm. I, I say this for everybody because I have seen so many apps that are amazing, but they don't build community. And I've been a teacher and I've worked in education and we cannot tech find technological solutions for social problems. There's gotta be a mix of those two going forward. So I think that the topic is important, but there's a social component that always has to be there. So that's my two cents. Yeah. Thank I see you, it's 149. That. I think that's a good note on which to uh, wind up. What do you think, Tyler? Yeah, I think, yeah, Liz, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for bringing in that perspective. I think that's really crucial for for all the teams, really think about that community aspect. That's really key. And I, I think also one of these things is, you know, for all of these, for all of these projects, it's not that there's, it's not that it's um, hard to think of a community who would be interested in this, you know, like kids love ants, like kids are playing with ants all the time, you know, and the, there are communities around each of these ideas that are sort of out there. But the key is building something that is, intentionally bringing in those people and, and bringing them as a part, contributing part of the project. So I think that was beautifully said, Liz. Um, and uh, yeah, I think with that, it looks like we have one minute left. So I'm going to close the other breakout. Uh, and I'll bet and you with the right community, I could actually have somebody who could show me how to put a slide in a fold scope. I think uh, there's a bunch of those folks around here who know it, but <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt, but just to say, <laughs> and if you look at the fold scope community, it's an example. It's just amazing the, the stuff that's on that community. Manu talked about it so eloquently. Thanks. Okay, that's thanks great. everyone. Yeah, this was a great discussion. Thank you everyone for contributing. Thank you everyone. Thank you. So what happens now, Tyler? We I think go everyone to, will back. So we're gonna session. we're gonna have the uh, health folks join us again, um, and I think uh, they've got around sixty seconds to join us. And uh, Manu will do a little. Oh, intro I see for Manu the final has now question. joined us. Yeah. Hey everybody! Uh, sorry, we end up having way too much fun in these breakout rooms. Yes, uh, that's right. A quick comment, just I was finishing a sentence while I got teleported. So uh, what we will do for many of the health teams for the next class will be a quick review on the regulatory side of the process as well. So people have an understanding of what does it mean if you make a medical device, especially a diagnostic device, because many of you are working on that from a regulatory perspective. 
and where are the new avenues? I mean, I think you all have to remember in the context of the pandemic, home testing will become a completely new category that so far has not been developed so much, but we now have a need for future pandemics. So the regulatory framework will be changing. And I'll see if there is somebody uh, from uh, the legal side of things who could join the class briefly commenting on that. Um, okay, so going back, uh, any, any comments from the education uh, discussions? Uh, any takeaways from? Uh... Yeah, I think we had a, a very good uh, session and ended up with a, a wonderful uh, uh, input from Liz, who uh, stressed the need to build a community uh, and uh, picked, of course, Foldscope as a fine example. And she, uh, she did a terrific job, I think, firing us all up uh, to get us to uh, make sure that uh, we engage a community rather than having an app that just is out there and no one uses it. Uh, mm -hmm. Would anyone else mm -hmm. like to uh, suggest anything? Patrick, do you have anything to comment on? Yes. <laughs> oh, Patrick, you're muted. You're Patrick, muted. you're muted. Oh, can you, Tyler, fix that? No, I or... can do it. I'm sorry. I, I just was trying to oh. not barge in. Briefly, I had the fold scope. I had a slide. I have these uh, these samples from 2014 of composting uh, toilet discharge uh, that I was going to check and see whether you could possibly see if they were free of Hellman things. And uh, I've gotten, you know, it's been it's only been since 2014. I haven't looked at this sample since I brought them home. Uh, but so I, I looked quickly, and sure enough, the tutorials on the community uh, show me how to get a slide in there, and then I'm just uh, here I am. <laughs> so that community is really important. <laughs> And on yeah, that note, I mean, I'll I pipe down. <laughs> I can say a word about the community side, even from our past. Uh, I mean, everything that we have done in the context of education has shifted from tools to communities. And so it's an immense part. And I think when we talk a little bit about in next week, we will swap roles and we will do uh, this context again for the sets of teams. But from an education perspective, it's I mean, I'm so glad that everybody converged on that as a key criteria to be thinking about, because especially in the context of education, you have to co-create because the teachers and the users that are engaged in your tool are the primary drivers also of how you're providing them the right sets of tools, but the way they use your tool completely changes your interaction. So I think, uh, and we will talk a little bit about uh, uh, next week, or probably two weeks from now, uh, thinking about just community, our own frugal science community at large, of what happens when this class is over. I mean, this is already uh, seeds for, I have lots of plans that I've been thinking about of how to structure our interactions without overburdening everybody's life uh, in a manner that uh, many of the things that we are launching as projects are only the initiation points. They're not I don't expect anybody to have accomplished the goals that we all have to, but we need to make sure that a community structure is put in place uh, to enable this work to keep continuing as well. Uh, one last note I wanna mention based uh, prompted by what Rico had said on expectations for the class. Again, I think the criteria is many of you are at crossroads and it always feels this really puzzling. And again, in science, Fabian, me, all of us who just do academic work on a daily basis, face this criteria all the time. We are always facing crossroads and you're never completely sure that you're taking the right step. If you are completely sure, somebody would have already done it. So feel comfortable in the confusion that you're in right now. This is a moment in science called being in the cloud. And remember, you know, the way we tell a story and often enough when we think we're going from A to B, but often enough being in the cloud, you might actually stumble upon something that is even far more important than what you thought. So instead of going to B, you might end up going to C, but it was actually all along the right place to be as well. So you have to just be comfortable with this idea that you have so many choices, but you have to take one. The purpose of this class is to learn and train yourself in a way where given an idea, you can convince yourself that this is an approach analytically, quantitatively that has legs. 
once you've done that, then you can put a lot more time and resources on the idea to truly develop products. We're not expecting finished products in any way. What we are expecting is your thought process in how you have enough of a capacity or enough sort of things lined up in your final presentations that really convince another person to say, oh, this is very well thought out to a point that you have things laid out. Some of you will have experimental data. Some of you will not be able to generate experimental data and that's okay. But you would have laid out exactly the kind of tests and experiments you need to do to prove or disprove that idea. And I think many of you will take very different approaches because some of the solutions might be more community oriented. Some of the solutions are very technology oriented and each one of them will have a different output. Uh, and I think you know the challenges are that we're all working in this distributed context, uh, but it's very valuable for the next two or three weeks that we have left to use the tool of convergence. Are you all converging? And there is a power in this because you're all trying to convince each other that this subsection of a thing and remember solving a very subsection of a problem of a large problem is very tangible. So if you solve, I mean, we were just talking about uh, with a couple of groups in a health context and narrowing down the broader problem to a very, very well-defined sub-problem is perfectly reasonable in the time frame of this class. And actually science progresses with small steps. So that's, I don't know, Rico, does that answer your question on expectations of, um, yeah, it's it's actually perfect. Uh, I, I'm I'm free, furiously writing notes right now, and thank you. Awesome. Okay, so we will connect again. Uh, oh, wait a second. Next Tuesday is the vote. Vo it's November third. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, okay, so November third, uh, and I am uh, I am open to feedback, but I am thinking of actually not meeting on November third, and just. Uh, kind of, I mean, I'm assuming a certain percentage of people who are voting uh, would uh, just go and vote and convince other people to vote. Uh, and instead of the global class session, I'll just open up the same time for personally for me for uh, office hours. And then I'll do just one-on-one -on -one meeting. Anybody else who can do office hours, one-on-one -on -one meetings on mentors, um, I spoke to several of you. I've also spoken to a few of the mentors and I am about to upload this Excel sheet, Tyler, with the names of the mentors. Uh, Fabian had a point. Go ahead, Fabian. No, I was just saying I'll be available oh. uh, Tuesday. Yeah, uh, so any of the hours. mentors that are available can open up their office hours on Discord, but we will not meet as a class uh, just by policy. I think this is something that's important to make sure that all the time if we can convince, I know my, many of you might have already voted, but pick up the phone and call your friends and check on them to say, hey, did you vote today? That's the criteria for November 3rd. Uh, November 6th, we will have a discussion with a phenomenal leader in global health, uh, Madhu uh, from University of McGill, who would lead a session on equity in global health, the sets of challenges, the history of colonialism in global health, and how to really think about ways forward and especially challenges in TB in general. Uh, and I think uh, a week after that, we will have Liz joining on conservation efforts uh, and biodiversity loss just as, but then again, we will continue these sets of discussions, uh, but majority of your time should be really focused now on your projects. Uh, and if some of you have specific needs of prototyping you can request on Discord and other individuals who might be in other teams but have prototyping capabilities can help as well, as long as you are kind and gentle in your requests. And uh, you know, I, I believe in this community, many other people will be able to help. I saw there's roughly around 15 or 20 3D printers already uh, amongst this small group. Uh, so on that note, it's two o'clock. Uh, uh, we will say bye. It's, oh, go ahead, Tyler. So yeah, there, there is, uh, by the way, just everyone, there is going to be a time change in the U.S. Uh, next week. So depending on how your time has shifted, whether or not it's shifted, it's going to be confusing. So it's either an hour earlier or an hour later or at the same time, depending on where you are. 
So I would uh, just check on <laughs> worldtimebuddy.com so you can compare <laughs> your time to this time. It's still going to be at the at the usual uh, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, but I don't know what time it's going to be where all of you are. So, so I uh, hope for India it doesn't become worse, but I have to say there will be more than just time change on our end post the next week. I hope the change is going to be much bigger than just a time change. Okay. On that note, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank bye you, everyone. Bye.